Thanks for joining us on My Life. We're back with uh, episode three with Randy Davison, longtime Oxford resident. He's got such a great story to tell. We just couldn't cut him off after two episodes. <laughs> but among all the other things, the riding of the horse, the motorcycling, the real estate brokerage, you got involved with Little Caesar, and that's where I'd like to pick that up. This was back uh, approximately what year? 1986. And how, what, what was the sequence of events that led friend, you towards that? A friend that? of mine had gotten into Little Caesars, and he said there were, all of Michigan was gone, and all of Florida was gone. And um, How long had Little Caesars been going at this point? Were they pretty new? I think 1959 was their, when they built their first 59. store. 59. Now oh. there's an American success story, if yeah. there ever was one. They opened a uh, pizza treat, they called it. They sold pizza and chicken. And um, they have seven beautiful children. Um, and the, um, the story is that uh, Mrs. Um, Illich? Illich. Um, she is... Um, the bean counter, so to speak. She's the one that makes sure uh, she keeps the records and so on. And he is, she, she, um, um, she's the one that run, that's on the rudder. He puts the wind in the sails. Ah. He's an idea guy, he can forecast and see things, you know. And um, they tell stories that they were so grassroots that they were rocking the children under the counter as they're waiting on customers with their foot, rocking the cradle. And um, in fact, one of, the, one of the daughters, maybe the oldest one, is an attorney mm -hmm. and uh, for the co corporation. Yeah. It sounds kind of like your story, doesn't it? It is. My wife is highly intelligent, and, um, and she loves record keeping and that kind of thing. I'm the guy that... I I will take a calculated risk. I don't gamble. I don't gamble. I take a calculated risk. I look at the pros and cons and so on and so forth and try to make a judgment on whether I should do a certain thing. For instance, I, I mentioned in an earlier show, I made a good living in real estate by basically, of course, a musician being a uh, being, being employed constantly as a musician helped a lot, you know, because my wife didn't work outside the home after our children started coming. Okay, let's get back to the Little Caesars and you're, you're mm -hmm. finding out about it. You said you find, learned that there were some franchises available down in, south? In, in, in Alabama, yeah. A place called Athens, Alabama, was on Highway 31. South of there is Decatur, Alabama. South of there was a place called Coleman, Alabama, and I open stores in all three locations. Okay, but here you are, a Michigan boy, family in Michigan, business in Michigan. What was so tempting about going south with this business that, that you never had anything to do with before? Well, I was looking for other opportunities business-wise, for one thing. And Little Caesars was going real strong. Good product and good, good training. They they train their their um, um, franchisees, you know, uh, well. And so um, it looked like something I wanted to do. You mm -hmm. know, had a daughter. One of the daughters, my second daughter, Julie, was a very intelligent young lady. Graduated from Pontiac Business Institute. She was a legal secretary. Um, and so I, I offered this opportunity to her, and she, she said, yeah, that'd be great. Any second thoughts about leaving Michigan and moving that far away? She may, um, for me or For you her. or her? Uh, probably. Or your wife? <laughs> probably. Yeah, my wife tends to be a very cautious person, you know. She, did you have a you-want-to-do-what moment with your wife? <laughs> yeah. Um, Say that again. <laughs> Did your wife look at you and say, you want to do yeah, what? Yeah, so, something like that, yeah. <laughs> but uh, again, you know, as I said, I made a good living in real estate. Where I made money was the purchasing of property. Right. And which I still own a number of them today, you know. And so... Um, so it wasn't too hard to phase out that because you, 
you owned what you owned and mm -hmm. you could sell what you wanted to sell. What we but were you... hoping to do was to develop a business that would be a good income for us, income for our daughter, and as, when we pass, she would become owner of the okay. stores. So, so how did that work out as you got started down there? We, we did very well. Okay. And, yes. It was an easy switch? Well, she took the training and so on, the in-store training. Well, I did too. And um, so, yeah, it was an easy switch. I so sold, lots, well, I, I guess selling is selling, but, but still you're selling pizzas down there and you're mm -hmm. selling property up here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I kind of phased out of the real estate business after about, let's see, that was about... Uh, I've been in the business about uh, about 20 years at that time, 65, 75, 85. Yeah, 20 years at that time. Uh, Julie um, went down there and um, opened the stores. What year was this when you got involved with Little Caesars? 86. 86, okay. 86. In um, July of 1994, she passed away very unexpectedly, suddenly. That's a sad story. Yeah. Yeah. She, she got um, um, congestive heart failure, and she thought she had a bad cold. She stayed home to nurse it and passed away at her home. Did she have a family at that time? No. She did not. No, Julie hadn't been married, and um, uh, no family. Uh, she loved children. She had a boyfriend, but that's about it, you know. So... I mean, obviously, this was unimaginable sadness, but but from a business standpoint, what did this do to you? Well, that caused us, because those are cash businesses, caused us to have to, within 10 days, get down there and take over those businesses ourselves. Yeah. Know? Now, had you purchased a home down there and everything? Yes. I Well, Julie purchased a home. I loaned her some money. She bought a a uh, 10 acre parcel on top of a mountain. And so ultimately, uh, when she passed, um, we, had, we, we started living there, yes. Okay, okay, and you still had the place, the Just family farm it, here in Oxford? Sold it, oh uh, yes, our, we kept our Oxford home, yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So, um, boy, that just, <laughs> you know, suddenly something like that just changed your whole life, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Were any of your other children involved in your businesses? No. no. Uh, what were your other kids doing? Well, oh, uh, one of them is an attorney. The oldest girl, Kathy, graduated. All, all five girls graduated here in Oxford. Mm -hmm. All were really good students. Kathy, probably the highest. She, um, she graduated valedictorian of her class. And then she went on to Michigan State and studied pre-law. And then she went to Ohio State. Somehow they they got her down there. I think they give her a free free ride. Ohio State. Yeah, and uh, because of her grades and so uh -huh. on, she graduated third out of a class of 297. Wow. Yeah, and um, so um, I asked her one time. I said, "What are you going to do when Michigan State plays Ohio State?" <laughs> and she said, "I can't lose, can I?" And I thought, she's going to be a brilliant attorney. <laughs> we're going to take a little break. Okay, we're going to be right back with Randy Davison in just a moment. Hi, everyone. Don't forget you can purchase DVDs of your favorite shows from OCTV, whether it's Minutes by Minute, Art Community Access, or Connie's Kitchen. Just call the station. Our number is 248-628-9658. And enjoy watching all of our shows on OCTV. Back with Randy Davison. Uh, we were talking about the very sad uh, death of your, your daughter and how it related to the uh, Little Caesars business down south. What kind of happened after that as far as the business goes? Well, uh, we took it over and Mary Ellen being the kind of person she is, she was real good at the record keeping. We were smart enough to keep... Mary Ellen is your wife, right? Wife. Okay. And we were firm enough to keep the accounting up here on this end, on our um, the computer. So we had we sort of know, knew, uh, you know, the financial end. Uh, excuse me, financial end of the business. Um, but um, you know, the day to day working in the store, it's hard work. You're on a hard surface floor, 
And if you're an owner, you're there a lot of hours. And mm -hmm. how many stores did you have down we there? We had three. Three. Mm -hmm. Were they close together? Uh, one was in Decatur. Two, two, excuse me. Uh, two were in Decatur and one in Common. Okay, very good. So how much longer did you carry on with that business down she there? She passed in... Um, in 1994, in um, July, and uh, we sold them to a young man who was a sales manager, or a, a store manager for another company, Little Caesars, and um, so uh, he had some partners that wanted to go into the business, and they we closed on a deal on um, in June of 96. About two, we actually ran them two years. About two years, yeah. So, uh, was that a good experience, that business? Yes, it was. It was an enlightening experience, but we were not prepared to work the kind of hours yeah. and the commitment that it takes and employees and so on. It, it's a lot to it. Sure. It looks like a simple little business. You drive by, you go in and order a pizza, but it's a lot of work. Yeah, I can imagine. So did you sell the place down south and come back here? Or? Well, we stayed down there for, um, we were there for 19 winters. And we sold it in, um, let's see, what would it be, October of 2013. Okay. And mainly, we would have kept that place and sold our Michigan home. Financially, it's a lot less expensive to live down there. However, um, our children, grandchildren, and now we have five, five great-grandchildren, and they're just so precious to us. The grandchildren, great-grandchildren, we, we just couldn't leave Michigan. We came back. A lot of memories around that place. Pardon? A lot of memories around that place. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. So what year did Eli come into the picture? Eli came into the picture um, 2000. So that was right around the time you moved back? March of 2000, yeah. about this time of the year. And uh, I had advertised for uh, a horse in Appaloosa. It had to be an Appaloosa, either register or register a bull. Now, let's talk about that for a second. What's special about an Appaloosa? Well, I wanted to do that Chief Joseph Trail ride right. that um, is a 1,300-mile ride. They do 100 miles each year because Chief Joseph and the Nesbers, the Appaloosa was their favorite horse. Now, when the Spanish came up from Mexico and first time in the United States, they, um, it was 1918. Could have been even before that. Oh, wait, uh, 15, yeah, 1598. Yeah, that's more like 1598, it. they came up. Now. Only the higher ranking officers were allowed to ride the, the loud Appaloosas. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? The ones that are the most colorful. The reason they were brought here is because they have a shuffle gait. If you go to my website and click on the, um, my um, the video. Interview. Yeah, and that's EliAndI.com, folks. EliAndI.com. E-L-I-A-N-D-I.com. Correct. And you click on video, and you'll see a three-minute interview with the NBC News affiliate in Honolulu, Hawaii, at the post office. So I used post offices that had the name of the town and state on them to document my rides. Okay, so they had a unique gait, didn't they? Yes. They um, very much like a Tennessee walk. Um, when a horse trots, the, 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 when the right, uh, when the... Uh, Left front hits the ground, the right rear hits the ground, like this. And it's a jarring ride. That's why people who ride English post. Some of the Western riders will post, meaning they'll lift themselves up and down to try to get in the rhythm. With, with this type of horse, you just sit there, it, it's smooth. Watch my belt in, when you go to that website when I'm riding Eli after the interview. You'll see my belt just stays, mm -hmm. stays level. And that's why they brought here, because they rode hundreds of miles and they wanted the smooth horse. So they came from Spain mm -hmm. originally. Now, 
I have seen um, a, um, a film by uh, Ripley, the, the man, uh, what was his first name, John Ripley? I can't think of it off the top of my head. Okay, Ripley. <laughs> Sorry. Um, Ripley's, believe it, believe or, it not. or not, yeah. And he's in Mexico, and there's an Appaloosa horse in the background. They say that there are pictures on the walls of caves down there that depict Appaloosa horses 20,000 years ago. So it's an old breed, and um, the Appaloosa Horse Club requires that you ride a registered Appaloosa on that ride. And so I advertised in the Walking Horse magazine. And I said I was looking for a, uh, they're also called walk -a -looses, okay? And um, I was looking for um, a gated Appaloosa. And the woman on the phone, bless her heart, she said, well, this is a walking horse magazine. I said, yeah, but I have a theory that if someone reads about that and, and knows someone in the neighborhood who has one of these horses, because they are rare, um, will call and let me know. Why they're rare is, um, in 1938, when the Appaloosa Horse Club was formed, um, they made a conscious decision to breed for a quarter horse with Appaloosa color, and they bred that, that gate out of them. So you have to find throwbacks, you know, mm -hmm. that uh, have survived. And I was going to drive 700 miles, my wife and I, to look at one in Missouri when a fellow called me from 30 miles away, and he had Eli. I went over and looked at him, and um, I said, um, uh, what, what do you call him down there? That you, you don't say, what's his name? You say, what do you call him? And he said, uh, Eli. And I remembered in the fourth grade that I st uh, they taught us about Eli Whitney inventing the cotton gin. Now, that was in Eli Whitney in, in 1765, mm -hmm. a woman attorney who was not allowed to argue a case in the Supreme Court at that time, said, Eli, you know, separating the seed from the cotton is a very laborious job. We need a machine that will do that. Eli worked on Bless's Heart for 25 years, and in 1790, he developed that machine. And if you go to Alabama in the cotton country today, you'll see these cotton gins around. That's what they do. Huh. And so um, I went to uh, see Eli, as I said, and um, I asked him what his name was, the, the owner. I said, what do you call him? He said, um, Eli, and I registered him as Eli Whitney. <laughs> and it seemed apropos, you know, sure. because we were right in the cotton country. They were working the ground up in March for uh, to plant in, in uh, April and May. Okay, we got to take a break, but we'll be right back with our final segment after this. You're watching OCTV, Oxford Community Television, serving Oxford, Addison Township, and the village of Leonard. Okay, we're back with Randy Davison, and we were talking about when you, when you bought Eli, and how you found him, and how you named him, and so on and so forth. So, while you were doing the Little Caesars stuff, was there a suppressed desire in your mind to own a horse? Is that what kind of... I have wanted ever since I started this ride in 1963. I had the first Appaloosa in Oakland County. Mm -hmm. Now, many others come in, they were a lot bigger than what I was, but I had an Appaloosa uh, filly from a quarter horse mare and an Appaloosa stallion. And I got bit by the bug, found out about this ride, and so I always wanted to do it. Now, at 2000, year, 2000, I was able to do the ride for the first time. And if you look at the map, you'll see that that, that purse nez, is it? Am I saying it correctly? That goes through some interesting places like Yellowstone National Park. Yes, they do. They went through Yellowstone National Park, became a park in, nine, in um, 1872. Mm -hmm. The Nez Perce went through there in 1875, 77, excuse me, 1977. And they, they did battle with some campers that were there in the park, and also the cavalry was chasing them. So that's, uh, that was the start of it. So that obviously was a good experience for you. 
going on that oh, ride. Oh, wonderful. It was it as good as you thought it would be? Yes, it was. Uh, how, though, when the Nez Perce left their homeland to try to get to Canada, they left with um, 800 people, 250 of which were warriors, rest women and children. The rest of the people were women and children, 2,000 horses. And some of the area that they traveled through, you wonder how the horses were able to find enough nourishment to yeah. stay alive. And so, um, one of the rides, the most memorable ride, is when the Nez Perce were up on this ridge, over, overlooking the Sunlight Basin in Wyoming, down to, excuse me, Sunlight Basin, Montana, down to southern end of Montana. The, um, they um, were being chased by the cavalry. General Miles was four miles ahead of them, and um, the uh, one-armed general who lost his arm in the Civil War was three miles behind them. And um, they, were, they were frantic to get off of this ridge. And uh, so they, they developed a switchback arrangement and rode the horses, 30-foot switchbacks. They'd ride this way down a little bit, 30 feet, and then this way. And we did too. It took us 35 minutes to go from the top down to the bottom. And it was narrow. I'd say maybe the widest point, 18 inches, mm. you know, and um, sand and shale rock. So anyway, they what they did is they sent Braves back, 25 Braves went back uh, two miles toward um, General Howard. Incidentally, incidentally, his uh, grandson was our trail boss. Really? Yeah. And uh, so anyway, um, they drug tree limbs and trees around on the ground to create a cloud dust. Mm -hmm. General Howard thought the, the Nez Perce had turned was going to come back for a final battle, so they, they dug in. That gave the Nez Perce time to get the 800 people and 2,000 horses down into the Sunlight Basin. Yeah. Let me describe that for you. The, um, the uh, Yellowstone River, um, goes through there. Uh, it's a canyon floor, probably a mile, mile and a half wide, with red rock walls that go up about 500 feet on each side. Wow. It's indescribably beautiful. And when we got down there, we, walked, we rode the horses for two solid miles on stones, various size stones and so on. We crossed the Yellowstone River and um, that's why when Eli slipped on those stones in Hawaii, it was in a previous broadcast, um, I didn't, when John said, hey, watch out for those stones, I, I rode over stones for miles in the sure. Rocky Mountains. Yeah. But Let's that, touch on Hawaii. I, I'm trying to get my mind around how a horse gets from the mainland to Hawaii. That's a long trip. Hmm. It is, and when I was riding on the uh, Continental Divide in um, about 40 miles east of um, Gallup, New Mexico, I, would, I kept asking people all the time, how can I get a horse to Hawaii? Well, of course, you can fly one there. I didn't have the kinds of means to fly a horse. That would cost, I, I don't know what it would cost. I don't want to know, it scare me. You know? You'd have to almost hire a military <laughs> transport or something. So, but one lady said, I don't know how she does it, but she takes horses to Hawaii for horse shows. Mm -hmm. Take a horse to Hawaii for a horse show. I mean, what kind of, what kind of wealth must they have to afford to sure. do that? Anyway, uh, she connected me with uh, a couple of people. Turned out there was a woman in two miles, um, two hours north of Oakland, California, who had made this container size. Um, Stall, stalls, um, they were 10 box stalls. A container is the size of, of, of something they put on an ocean going ship to, to um, it may be food, it could be automobiles. So, could the, be, uh, so the horse had some room to move so around. So he had some room to move around. Did they, did they ever take him out for a he, walk or anything? No. He was on the water five days. Five days. But he could lay down, he could get up, he yeah. could move around, yes. 
So actually, he was on the water both ways 10 days. Yeah. John, I paid for a 10 day cruise for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I hope he did. He ever the go cruise. on another one? <laughs> I've never been on a cruise, but Eli has been. <laughs> oh my! And goodness. when I got there, uh, uh, the um, uh, they inspected Eli, and he looked great. I had looked him all over to be sure he was all right. Uh, a man had you know had gone across for the horses, and to take care of him and feed yeah. him and so on and so forth, and. Um, a, a, uh, a Japanese man who owns uh, ranches, plural, ranches yeah. in Hawaii, um, boarded him for me. He picked him up at the uh, dock and took him out to the ranch. And when I needed him to ride somewhere, he would, um, uh, he would load him up and, and bring him wherever I need to ride. Uh, before we go, I have to ask you, in all these travels with Eli, what was your absolute worst experience that you had? Well, probably when I was going up a mountain, um, going from um, Crescent City, California, and this was a real mountain. I looked back and there's black smoke coming out of the side of the trailer. I thought I was on fire. I ran back there and what had happened is the, the um, the wheel on the um, third axle, center axle, had bent over the axle bent, and the tire was rubbing on the trailer. And um, so I stopped, and there was a fire truck behind me. And so I said, well, how did you guys get here so fast? He said, we're stationed here. So many people have transmissions burn up on automobiles sure. and engines and so on and so forth. Can you imagine that? They're, I wrecked their fire engine there and there all the time. Amazing. So anyway, he said, there's a state trooper here. He'll take you back into um, into Crescent City, you know, or he'll, he'll go in front of you. And I drove about 15 miles an hour for 20 miles to get back in there to a rodeo ground that I had just left that morning. <laughs> so I asked somebody, I said, um, where can I get this trailer fixed? He said, there's a repair shop right over there. And I could see the repair shop yeah. from the, from the road to ground. Okay. The other side of the coin. Mm -hmm. Of all the states, all the territories, all the provinces, Alaska, Hawaii, what was the absolute best experience that you've had? Redwoods in California. Really? Yeah. Uh, Crescent City, California had the coastal redwoods. They grow in a grove about 25 miles wide and 200 miles long. And they're, they're the redwoods that we use for building sure. various things. And um, it was just such an amazing, I drove through there twice. I drove the full length of California twice, once from south to north and the other time north to south. So I knew about the redwoods. And um, I rode, um, one to ride there and um, I, I, I tell people this way, one man rode into that grove of trees for about three hours, but a different man rode out. Yeah. Those trees were seedlings when Christ walked the earth. I, I, I had, it was such an experience, and it's hard for me to explain what it was, but I'm much more spiritual today than I ever was before. Yeah. I know we could talk a lot longer than we have. Uh, thank you so much for being with us, Randy. Uh, I just want to mention to the folks that uh, Randy Davison is available for speaking engagements. He is a longtime Oxford resident, so he is around here. If you want to visit his website, it's eliandi.com. That's E-L-I-A-N-D-I.com. His contact information is on there. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. It's a, it pleasure, a pleasure having you. And huh? thank you for joining us, too.